All right, the Proverbs 31 woman. If you didn't know Proverbs 31, you do now, but that's a famous proverb. And the whole proverb is actually about uh, being a virtuous woman. So we're going to go through this and look at the different attributes of a virtuous woman uh, for Mother's Day this morning. So whenever people think of a virtuous woman, they always like to think of the Proverbs 31 woman. Nobody really likes to think of the Ephesians 5 woman. <laughs> if you know your Bible, we'll, we'll look at that in a moment. But yeah, people are like, yeah, Proverbs 31 woman, Ephesians 5 woman uh, and is not so popular. But we're going to talk about that this morning. Now, being a mother, it's one of the most important jobs in the world, isn't it? Um, and like with any job, you can, you can do it well or you can do it poorly. You know? So it's not so much about just being a mother. You want to be a, a good mother, you know, when we think about Mother's Day. But, you know, sadly, there's a satanic agenda out there. Obviously, Satan wants to destroy the family, take the mother out of the home. Uh, and it's no secret that that is what the world is trying to do, where they're trying to um, diminish the importance of the mother's role in the family and they're trying to get women seeking to fulfill the role of men, right? And saying that that is something that is more fulfilling and more purposeful for a woman. But God's will for a woman is very clear. You know, when we think about what the will of God is for a woman, there's no secret about this. Uh, in 1 Timothy 5, and, and for those of you who know your Bibles, you know where I'm going. 1 Timothy 5, 14, I will therefore that the younger women, look at this, marry bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. So you can see what God's will for a woman is very clear, right? We see this here in Titus 2.3 as well. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to watch much wine. Look at this teachers of good things. I just want you to note that because now he's going to list some good things that are being taught by the older women to the younger women. Verse 4, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet. What is that? Discreet is like, you know, you have some discretion, right? Chase is like purity. Keepers at home, good obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Now, many Christians, when we read these passages, still cringe at these passages. And why? It's because you don't believe these things are good things. You know, if you bought into the world's mentality that this is like abusive and oppressive, maybe you don't have the right understanding of why God has these passages here. And what you need to really shift and renew your mind on is when God talks about the will of God for a woman, it's because this is the highest calling that a woman can go for, right? Like what is the whole point of, you know, family is to raise our children, right? It's to raise children and to bring them up in the ways of the Lord. So we never want to see the job of a mother, right, as something that is like cringe or oppressive and buy into how the world sees it. There's a reason why God has this will for a woman. You know, men provide for the family and women keep the home. Why? It's because God wants a, a godly seed. It's all about raising godly children. So, do you as a Christian still look at these verses and, you know, worry about them? Or do you read them and know, yes, these are good things, and there's great honour in being a mother, in being, you know, uh, a mother at home, raising the children, rather than trying to do what a man should be doing, which is the career and the job, trying to provide for his family. That obviously should be his purpose. Now, it's funny with Mother's Day, right? Because, you know, with Mother's Day, often when, uh, you know, let's say a Christian woman or somebody, maybe they're even not a Christian, right? But they have chosen to be a full-time mother. And they stay at home, they take care of their family, you know, they clean and do all the things that mothers do. What will the world often say? They'll often say, oh, you're just a housewife. You're just a mother. You know, like you haven't achieved anything. But then, then come Mother's Day, right? Then you start hearing, oh, mothers, it's the hardest job in the world. You know, you see all the Facebook posts, oh, you have to be a chauffeur and a counsellor and a teacher and a chef and, you know, and it's, it's all about like, oh, mother's like, oh, it's the most difficult job in the world. So what is it then? Is it the most difficult job in the world and it's something worthy to pursue or is it you're just a housewife, you're just a mother? Which one is it? 
You know, they can't make up their mind. So there's a bit of contradiction here. Well, we know which one is the right position, right? The right position is, yeah, it is a difficult job. It's a valuable job, and it's a very important job. So we don't want to buy into the world's ideas of what it means to be a good mother uh, and be a godly woman, right? So this extends. This is not just for mothers. I know it's Mother's Day today, but obviously Proverbs 31 is about the virtuous woman, right? So it extends even to those that are not mothers this morning. And I think it's important that, you know, you don't, for men not to tune out, right? Men should not tune out because you need to teach your daughters, you know? You, you need to know. So sometimes when people listen to sermons and it's like a topic that they don't think is relevant to them, you're wrong. Because if it's in the Bible, it's relevant to you, right? It may not be relevant to your specific situation, but you may know somebody that needs this knowledge. Don't you need to know God's word? You need to know God's word because sometimes you need to help guide somebody like a daughter, you know, or a lady that may be looking to you for biblical advice on, you know, what it means to be a godly woman and why this is something that God has for women and it's not just about, you know, patriarchal and all this sort of stuff that uh, the world accuses us of, right? So let's look at some things in Proverbs 31. We read through the whole chapter. We're going to go through it verse by verse and just show some attributes that are being pointed out uh, that I think we can draw from in Proverbs 31. So my first point is the Proverbs 31 woman. What does the Proverbs 31 woman do or have? Number one is we want to talk about children, the value of children. The fact that the Proverbs 31 woman has children in Proverbs 31. Now, some people think that only Proverbs 31 verse 10 onwards is about the virtuous woman. But notice that even from the very first verse in Proverbs 31, it is a proverb of a mother teaching her son. Right? So you can see that the whole chapter is actually about this Proverbs 31 virtuous woman. The words of King Lemuel, look at this, the prophecy that his mother taught him. So isn't it interesting that Proverbs 31 is the word of God taught to what a lot of people believe is Solomon here, another name for King Lemuel, he actually got this proverb. So the word of God came through his mother and then he penned down this proverb. What my son, right? And what the son of my womb. So notice that, that it is her son that she has given birth to and what the son of my vows. And what I just want to point out here, and I have an underline is, hey, notice that this is not a son that is born in fornication. Right? So this is a son that is born within the covenant of marriage, the son of my vows. So we can see the righteousness there of the virtuous woman. So my son, she has children. Right? Children are not just an add-on to a mother's, you know, or a woman's real achievements. You know, often career women think that way. You know, they, they, what they really want to achieve in life, you know, change the world and do this or whatever. And I better have some children along the way and you know, have them and stick them in daycare, have somebody else raise them. I mean, that's what happens in, you know, in China and whatnot. They just have the maid just raises them. You know, just hire somebody to raise their kids. It's just like something you just tick off rather than an accomplishment in your life and you know, something you're going to pour your life into to build up the next generation. You know, obviously, assuming you have children, because you know, obviously some women are not able to have children. So I'm saying it's one of the greatest achievements. So you don't want to feel like just because you don't have children, Therefore, you can't accomplish anything great. But we've got to remember to keep things in perspective. You know, when we think about, and I already talked about this, about the role of husband and wife. Why is it important that women keep the home? Why? Because they, they're the ones that breastfeed and they're the ones that give birth to children. And why do men go out and work? Well, they go out and work. The purpose is to provide for their home. You know, it's because people have other purposes. That's why they start thinking, well, I want to go out, I want to make a name for myself and whatnot. Then women think, well, I want to be able to make a name for myself too. But that's not what men are meant to be thinking about. Right? Men are meant to be thinking about serving God, providing for their family. That's why they are out there working and trying to make a living. That should be the higher goal. Right? Now think about this. The value of children. I often get people to think this through like this, to realize, you know, 
how valuable children should be to you. Because a lot of Christian, even a lot of Christians, still do not value children the way that they ought to. You know, and it comes out when they think, oh, you know, well, you know, I want to wait a few years before we have children. Or, you know, I'm going to, you know, oh, you know, two children is enough for me. Or one children is enough for me. That's the sort of attitude that comes across when I think Christians don't have an attitude of valuing children the way they should. Why do I want a lot of children? You know, it's because it's commanded. No, it's because I, I value children. You know, and, and God values children, so we want to do something that is of value. Now, let's say a woman does go down the career path, right? Let's say you study hard, and you, know, you get that break, you get into that company that you want to work for, and you work hard, you slave away, you make a name for yourself in that company, and then you, know, you get that break, you, you move into upper management, and oh, you know, you, you, you're changing the world, you're doing all this stuff, right? And you, and you reach the pinnacle of career aspirations, right? Let's say you made it, you did it, now let me ask you, like, let's say that woman had a child. And let's say for some reason, whether the child gets sick or, you know, whatever scenario you can think of, she had to trade that accomplishment, you know, that career, those career ambitions to save the life of the child. Do you think she would do it? Would you do it? And hopefully you would think, oh, in an instant, if, it, if I had the choice between saving the life of my child and, you know, having this great career or this great business that I built, you would trade it in an instant. So doesn't that show you that the value of a child is so much more valuable than anything you could accomplish? Do you know what I mean? So you see how we, we tend to think of children as, a, you know, they get in the way of your plans. They, 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 I, I, I have children and I have to give up in order to accomplish this. But wouldn't it be worth it? Because most people would trade it all in order to save the life of that child. But why won't people trade that life to have another child? Or to have a child to begin with? Do you see what I'm saying? So people see it's because we don't tend to value things until they're there, right? So when they're there, and now the life may be lost, you realize the value of that life because you would do whatever it takes to save that life. Well, why won't people do whatever it takes to gain that life? Does that make sense? Or why, if we realize that life is so valuable, that we would say, well, I only want one. <laughs> one is enough. So this is why, if you realize the value of children, I think we all do, because if we were in that situation, we would probably make that choice. If somebody's life was at stake, we'd say, do whatever it takes to save that life. But yet, we won't, we don't value it in order to attain that life, to gain that life, and to have that life be a part of our family. This is what's so sad about abortion. You know, abortion is like, you know that that child will become something. And it's like, why would you, you know, extinguish the life of that child when you know how much joy and how much purpose the life of another child has? So you value children. You know, all Christians should value children, but especially uh, Christian women. Look at what it says here in Proverbs 14. Every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. All right, so that's the first one. She values children. The second one is she is a teacher. She is a teacher. Look at this, Proverbs 31, verse 1. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. So you see how a ver the Proverbs 31 woman teaches her children right and wrong, just like we talked about here, that this whole chapter is about the Proverbs 31 woman. And we see a mother teaching her son. Look at this, Proverbs 6, verse 20. My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of God thy mother. Proverbs 29, 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself, look at this, bringeth his mother to shame. So teaching your children, it entails both the nurture and the discipline, doesn't it? Right? So as a woman, you know, we're talking about mainly women this morning, but as a mother or woman, you need to be also responsible for disciplining your children. Too many women sometimes use the wait till your father gets home. Wait till your father gets home. 
but you want to also have the clout in your home where they fear mom as well. You know, they don't just fear dad, right? You want your child to fear you also so that when you speak, they pay attention too. And then you won't have to say, wait till your father gets home, right? So now not only that, not only does, you know, we saw in Titus 2 before that, you know, a, a, a virtuous woman teaches the young women how to behave, you know, how to dress, all that sort of thing. Proverbs 31, look at verse 3. Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty, and remember his misery no more. Open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. So notice, and we talked about this briefly before, when I say, hey, men, don't tune out when you're learning about how to be, you know, what it is to be a virtuous woman, the Proverbs 31 woman. Because here we see a mother not only able to teach good things to the young women, but here she is teaching good things to a young man as well, warning him about the dangers of women, warning him about the dangers of alcohol, and also telling him to, you know, speak up and to protect the weak and the oppressed. When she says, open thy mouth, for the dumb in the cause of all such as are appointed, right? So she's teaching him, hey, be a man that stands up as a leader and protects those that are weak, right? Too much today, we have men taking a back seat, right? Men taking a back, women are the ones that are making everything happen, standing up for what's right, taking a stand, speaking out against things, while the men, what do they do? You know, they're on the couch playing video games, you know, on the couch doing this, you know, you're just, just taken away with their job, you know, messing around with the boys, and then the women are the ones that are, you know, keeping society together. That ought not be the case, right? That's for men to do. Men are meant to take the lead and to set the example, right? So you can see here that she is a teacher, not only to women, but also to young boys as well. She can impart wisdom. All right, number three. Number three, we see that a virtuous woman is a rare thing to find. Is a rare thing to find. Proverbs 31, verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. So it's not easy to find a virtuous woman. You know, will you heed the call to be a virtuous woman? Woman. Her price is far above rubies. Now, you don't want to seek to be valued in the eyes of the world, right? So it's not about what the world thinks of your value, like we talked about before, you're just a housewife, you know, you're just a mother. No, no, we want to be valuable in the eyes of God. Look at what it says here in 1 Peter 3, who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair, of wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel. Right? This is how the world measures value in a woman, right? The clothes you wear, you know, you know, all the women putting their photos on Facebook and Instagram. Is your value by how many likes you get? You know, how many hearts you get on Instagram? That's how a lot of women measure their value today, right? They're, they're valuable in the eyes of the world, right? By how they dress and, or, or how they don't dress, should I say. <laughs> the clothes they don't put on as opposed to the clothes they put on. Who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold and of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament, right? The ornament is like a, you know, what does they say? Like a thing that's there to, what, what may, is, is there to decorate something, right? The ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So what is of great price in the sight of God? Well, we see the modesty being alluded to in verse 3. But then in verse 4, we see the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. So what does it mean to be meek? See, meekness, have you heard, this, heard the saying? Meekness is not weakness. Right? So meekness is about being humble. But being humble doesn't mean you're weak. 
that you're a pushover, that you don't have intelligence, that you don't have an opinion. But meekness, what do they say? It's power under control. Yeah, you may know that you're capable, but you submit to the authority knowing where your role is and your place sits. You know, are you smarter than your husband? Maybe. <laughs> you know, are you smarter than your dad? Maybe. But you have that power under control and you still submit. It's a bit like, you know, at work, you may be more knowledgeable than your boss, but you still respect the position that the boss holds. Why? Because you respect what God has commanded of you. The ornament of a meek, and look at this, and quiet spirit. Quiet. Does that mean that you can't say anything, that you can't talk? No, but what it does mean is a godly attribute of a woman is she should not be known as a loud mouth. You know what I'm saying? So women, you know, sometimes, some, you probably know women like this, right? They're loud mouth, when they're in the room, everyone knows they're there, you know, always talking over everyone, always that. That's the sort of attribute that God does not want for a woman because it's also in the way you dress, you want to be modest, but in the way you behave yourself, a woman should be modest as well which is in the sight of God of great price. So this is the sort of attributes that God has for a woman. And men also, you know, you don't want to compromise godliness for beauty. You know, is it all right to find a woman that you're attracted to? Of course. But sometimes people will compromise character. They'll say, ah, oh, you know, we'll work that out. But she's so beautiful. I'll tell you what, guys, you know, that, that beauty wears off very quickly without character. You know, say within a couple of months of marriage, you know what I mean? That, that beauty is going to wear off really quick if you don't have a godly woman, you know, which is an ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. So we don't want to be adorned just outwardly. We want to be clothed with character, right? And we see the virtuous woman later on clothed with character as well. Number four, the Proverbs 31 woman is a helper. Right? She is a support. That is the role of women. That's why they were created, to be a help that was suitable for the man. And this is why we have the man in charge of the family as the leader and the woman as the supporter. And that's who the Proverbs 31 woman is too. Look at verse 11. The heart of her husband. Right? She's married there. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that, she, so that he shall have no need of spoil. Right? See, she serves her husband faithfully. And right, not just in the material things, but can a husband trust a woman to also uphold his reputation? Sometimes, sometimes well, yeah, I cook and clean for him, but then I'm like, you know, backbiting him, you know, to all my friends around his back, to everyone in church, I'm telling him how terrible of a husband he is, you know, how terrible of a person he is. So not only can he trust in her in those aspects, but also materialistically, so that he shall have no need of spoil. So what is this word spoil? This doesn't mean that, you know, I talked a bit about ruining the reputation and whatnot, but that's not what this verse is talking about. Spoil, if you think about spoils, like the spoils of war. So spoils is when you get a, like a, like a windfall gain, right? Like you need to go out and make a lot of money and whatnot. So he's saying he's able to trust in his wife keeping the home, not just like wasting all his resources. So he doesn't have need to just always get spoils of war and just always get these high gains in order to, you know, keep the family, you know, provided for because his wife's like just, uh, just blowing it all on whatever. Verse 12, she will do him good right, and not evil all the days of her life. So that sort of plays back into, you know, she's out for his best interests and he can trust in her as that faithful support to help him accomplish the goals for the family. So she's a good helper, right? But we also see that she's financially intelligent, right? So that he shall have no need of spoil and she's obedient and supportive. So I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, you know, everyone likes the Proverbs 31 woman. Nobody likes the Ephesians 5 woman. Why don't they like, why is the Ephesians 5 woman not so popular? Verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And we want this balanced picture, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. 
I understand not everyone's marriage is the ideal situation, but it doesn't mean you can't do the right thing even in an unideal, unideal, unideal situation, right? Now, why does God have it this way? There's, there's many reasons, but basically, you know, there's, it's so it keeps sort of peace and order in the family, right? There is a defined leader and there's a defined supporter. But likewise, the, the wife should be an obedient and submissive follower. That doesn't mean that the husband ought to be just this oppressive leader, right? So I know, you know, any authority in life can be abused. It ought not be. That doesn't change what sort of follower you should be. Right? It's kind of like at work. All of us can relate to work, those of us who are working. You know, your boss might not be the best boss, but does that mean you don't do your job properly? You know, you have a contract and you have what you're meant to do as an employee. Even if your boss is a terrible person or whatnot, that doesn't change your responsibilities as an employee. So it's the same here with a woman. It doesn't change what God expects of you, but that doesn't mean it's okay for husbands not to love their wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So this is important, like I said, to keep peace and order in the home and also peace and order in the church because ultimately a church is made of families and a nation is made of families. So you can see if the family and the home has order, it has an effect on the circles that surround it, right? The church, the nation, and whatnot. Now I talked about at the beginning that you know, unfortunately, because too many Christians do not understand why this is valuable, why this is important, they cringe at verses like this. But that's why you need to understand why this is important. Because you know why? A virtuous woman, the Proverbs 31 woman, a godly woman, will perpetuate and teach the value of this. Right? They're not going to buy into the false narrative of the world and start complaining and say, oh, you know, this patriarchy, you know, we, we can learn good things from the Bible, but there are some things that are like outdated that we can just, you know, not, 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 don't need to worry about. No, that's not how it is. So godly women will, will set this example, they'll perpetuate, they'll understand the importance of it, right? But like I said, we're not to forget the man's responsibility in this relationship as well, right? So we want to have a balanced view. Now, number five, the Proverbs 31 woman, we see here that she is a hard worker. She is a hard worker. Now, being a woman doesn't mean you can't do some heavy lifting sometimes. You can't get your hands dirty and whatnot. You can't do these things. Look at what the Proverbs 31 woman did. Verse 13, she seeketh wool and flax. Look at this, and worketh willingly with her hands. You see what I mean? She knows that her job entails getting her hands dirty sometimes, getting in and doing things with her hands, right? This doesn't sound like the sort of woman that is always able to, you know, just maintain, you know, perfect nails and all these sort of things, right? Because she's using her hands, right? It's just practical. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. Look how many times her hands is mentioned in this passage. She is like the merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from afar. See, sometimes she has to travel to get food. Think about getting discounts sometimes. You know, maybe she has to travel to get her food. It's not always convenient just to get it from the corner store. She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. So notice how she's providing. She's working extra hours. She's working hard here from night until, you know, all early in the morning till late at night when everyone else is asleep. She considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands, she planteth a vineyard. So you can see here, she has some economic wisdom, doesn't she? She knows that she can look for a piece of property and she can like flip houses here, <laughs> right? So as you can see, this, this, this Proverbs 31 woman is not just somebody that's just ignorant with how the world works. She knows these things. She, she's a wise woman. But we're just talking about, hey, but her main priority and her concern is taking care of her family. But that doesn't mean she can't be entrepreneurial in some sense. Right? She planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. Right? So you, being a godly woman doesn't mean you're a weak woman. You know, we talk about the woman being the weaker vessel, but that doesn't mean she's weak and can't do anything physical. Right? She's just weaker than men in general. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. 
She stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. So she, she's a hard worker. And you think about in these days, this day and age in Proverbs 31, I mean, we think about hard worker now as the things that we deal with today. But try and live in a day and age where you have no washing machine, you know, you have no dishwashers, you have no plumbing, you know, no electricity, you know, no television, right, to keep the kids busy, you know, no iPads. So this will give you an idea of like what hard work really is. I, don't, I think most of us don't really understand hard work. You know, hard work to us is just, you know, a little bit of inconvenience because we're just so used to the conveniences. But we have to up our standard of hard work and realize, you know, we are a lazy generation because we've, we've been given a lot of uh, luxuries, right? A lot of machines that do things for us. I mean, no internet shopping, right? So she has to go and travel to buy these things. You know, she can't just get it delivered to her house now. So we have a, a lot of conveniences these days. And the last thing I just want to mention on this being a hard worker, notice how it's a lot of hard physical labor. So likely, in all likelihood, this Proverbs 31 woman is not overweight. Right? She's taking care of her health. I mean, I'd say eating organic is probably default in those days, right? There's not all this packaged food and whatnot. So she's probably eating organic, you know, things that have been grown in the farm, like around the corner or whatnot. But she's working hard. She's working, she's physical. And we need to be aware of that today in our day and age. It's very easy for us to be sedate. Right, because you have all the conveniences, you can be home all the time, you know, you've got the internet shopping, you're not always out doing hard labor, you know, all the hard labor is done by all the machinery that we, um, that we use. So we have to make sure that we are getting some exercise in, right? We don't want to be an overweight Christian lady. Being overweight is, is not a godly attribute. Now, I understand people have medical conditions and whatnot, I'm talking about people who are overweight because they're lazy. Right? There are people that are overweight because they're lazy. You don't want to be overweight because you're lazy. We need to make sure you take care of your health. And that's one thing I always think about when I think about the hard-working Proverbs 31 woman. Is she's not a woman that is not taking care of her health because she would be strengthening her arms and working hard doing physical labor. So if you don't do that in your life, you need to make sure you do some exercise to get that physical labor in so that you are not uh, you know, putting on weight unnecessarily. Right? Or not for medical reasons. All right, number six. The Proverbs 31 woman is modest. The Proverbs 31 woman is modest in how she presents herself. All right, I know you ladies don't like this one, but it always comes up, doesn't it? Proverbs 31 woman. Verse 22. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. So notice how clothing can be referred to as coverings. Why is it? Because it's meant to cover up the parts of your body that would be immodest if they were shown, right? Your breasts, your butt, your crotch, all that sort of things. So if clothing does not cover that, you're not being modest, right? So that's why there's no point wearing clothes like so tight. Like imagine if you just wore like a skin tight clothes right into the breast, right into the butt. And it's like, what's the point of even wearing clothes? Right? You may as well just walk around naked. So this is why clothes are there to cover. She, she maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Look at what it says here in 1 Timothy 2. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Right? So she's modest. She realizes the impact on her husband's reputation. And I think the way women present themselves, the way they speak, the way they dress, obviously that can have an impact on how the family and her husband is perceived. And I think she's aware of that. Proverbs 31, 23, look at this. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. Proverbs 12, 4, look at this. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. Right, so you can see there the virtuous woman, we talked about virtuous woman in Proverbs 31. 
virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. She knows the impact of her behavior on the reputation of her family and her husband. Proverbs 31, 24. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Look at this. Strength and honor are her clothing and she shall rejoice in time to come. So like we talked about just briefly before, where it's how God sees you, not how the world sees you. So what are the sort of clothes the virtuous woman should be thinking about is strength and honor, clothed with character, right? As opposed to just clothed with, you know, fancy clothes and that being um, how you draw your value from other people and from the world. All right? Number seven, we've got two more. Two more. The Proverbs 31 woman speaks wisely. She speaks wisely. She has wise words. Verse 26 in Proverbs 21, uh, 31. She openeth her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness. So this speaks to not only having knowledge about what you say, but also about how you say it. Right? So not only can she have wisdom, and she's just going around telling everyone and just like, I don't care, I just tell that's the truth, I'm going to tell you, you know? No, in her tongue is the law of kindness. So it's not only important that what you say is right, it also matters how you say it, when you say it, you know? It takes some wisdom. There's no, like, black or white there, but it takes wisdom to know, hey, is it the right situation? Is it appropriate? Is it kind? Will they receive it? Am I saying it in a way that they'll receive it? Am I saying it politely, respectfully? She openeth her mouth with wisdom. Now, you've got to have wisdom to open your mouth with wisdom. Right? So you've got to first learn and be, you know, like we learned about this morning, kids, like a wise man will hear, will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. So you've got to be a wise woman to have wise words, and part of sharing wise words is not only what you say, but how you say it. Now, why, why is it important how a woman communicates herself. Because, you know, women have a huge impact on the environment in their household. And, you know, the Bible actually talks about this impact of a contentious and, a, you know, a woman that is, like the Bible talks about, odious, right? An odious woman and the impact it has on the people around her. Look at here. I'll show you a couple of verses. These are quite humorous when you read through them. Proverbs 19, verse 13. A foolish son is the calamity of his father. Look at this. And the contentions of a wife are a continual dropping. What does that picture give you? Just a wife that's just nagging her husband all the time, right? So the way you communicate yourself and the way you open your mouth in the home can have an effect on your husband's relationship with you, the environment in your family. A continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Proverbs 21, 9. It is better to dwell in a corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. Right? So you can see here the effect of a woman. And it's like that. That's why the, as the saying goes, happy wife, happy life, right? So women ought to take heed to that and realize the impact that their attitude and their words can have in the home. Proverbs 21. So here we have, it's better to dwell in the corner of the housetop. And then you have here, Proverbs 21, 19. It is better to dwell in the wilderness. <laughs> I joke about it. It's better not even be in the house, right? Than with a contentious and an angry woman. Right? So I'm sure some men have felt this way before. But you know, as a woman, you don't want people in your house to feel this way. Right? You want to have that environment of a uh, home that is welcoming and warm. Proverbs 30. For these for three things, the earth is di disquieted. The earth is disquieted. <laughs> and for four, which it cannot bear, for a servant when he reigneth, and a fool when he is filled with meat, look at this, and an odious woman when she is married, and a handmaid that is heir to her mistress. Right? So a couple of proverbs there. So wise words. Note how your words have an impact on the environment that you set, right? And the last one we want to talk about is an attribute of the Proverbs 31 woman is that she's selfless. She's selfless. I think about Mother's Day this morning. You know, if you're a mother in the room and you think, oh, it's Mother's Day. I wonder what my family's doing for me this morning. I wonder what they're doing for me. 
Nobody called me. What are they doing for me? You know, often special occasions do the opposite of what, you know, really we should be reminded of what it means to be a great mother and what it means. One of it is to be selfless. But what is our attitude when it comes to Mother's Day? Is it a self-serving sort of attitude? You know, when we're disappointed and people didn't do all these things for us, or is it a reminder of the servant that we ought to be? And obviously this extends to every area of Christian life and men and women, young and old. But especially for mothers this morning, you know, are we selfless? Because the Proverbs 31 woman was selfless. Verse 27, she looked well to the ways of her household, right? Not to her own ways. She's looking after others. She's considering others. And eateth not the bread of idleness. And you know what? If you do, look at this, her children arise up and call her blessed. So you ought not need to demand praise from your family on Mother's Day, right? Because if you were the sort of mother that God wants you to be, I'm sure your children would appreciate it growing up. They'd want to be home. Remember we talked about the environment at home? You know, sometimes mothers or wives like nag and just create this toxic environment at home. Maybe that's why your children don't want to come back and visit you on Mother's Day, because they, they didn't enjoy being around you, right? If they enjoyed being around you, then they would want to come back, right? Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. So you see how she's praised not for her beauty. She is praised because of how she fears the Lord. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. And know that actions speak louder than words. So you don't have to talk yourself up, talk about how great of a mother you were. You know, your actions will speak louder than, than words. Your works will praise you in the gates. And what is the gates talking? That's where the elders talk, right? That's where the, the society is talking, where the elders of the, uh, of, the, of the nation are talking, or that tribe are talking. So she has a good reputation amongst the leaders in her tribe because of the things that she does. So how do you see Mother's Day? You know, I don't think people should be praised just for being a mother, right? Because it's, e it's easy to get pregnant, right? Obviously, I know the birth can be difficult, but it's kind of like starting a garden, right? It's easy just to start it, but that doesn't mean necessarily you're a good mother. So sometimes people are praised just to be a mother, but we, we want to seek to be praised because we are a good mother. Right? We are a virtuous mother that is fearing the Lord. That's what we want to be praised for. Right? And you know what? If we follow the ways of the Lord, your own works will be praised in the gate. So what are the attributes of a virtuous woman? She values children. She's a teacher. It's rare, right? So she, and she's valuable, but not in the eyes of the world, in the eyes of God. She's a helper, right? She knows her role in the family and what God expects of her, and she embraces that role and perpetuates that role. What? For the good of family, church, and society, right? And for God, first and foremost. She's a hard worker. So you can imagine, a hard worker wouldn't be overweight, right? Because she's doing physical labor. Modest. She dresses modestly, right? And she's modest in how she presents herself and speaks. She speaks wisely and she speaks kindly. And she's selfless. She considers other rather than herself. So the last thing I want to just leave you on, just a closing thought, is, you know, life is short. You know, children grow up, you know, faster than you realize. So you don't want to trade the opportunity to impact your children's lives for something less valuable. Right? This is what God wants for a woman, and why? Because it's the most, one of the most valuable things that a woman can do. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for uh, the teaching you have in your word about uh, what's best for our lives, Lord. And help us, Lord, to have the faith to believe your word and, uh, Lord, understand why uh, you know what's best and why it's valuable so that we can read and preach and share these thoughts with boldness. So I thank you, Lord, for the mothers in our church. May it always be a role that is honoured amongst your people. And we thank you so much, Lord, that uh, you know, women have given up, I'm sure, many of the things that they have had aspired to do to, to raise children. And I uh, pray, Lord, that you will help us, give us wisdom to do that. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.